Hey everyone, I'm Chef Dennis, and welcome to Around the Kitchen Table. Happy to have you here today, and my co-host, Susan Sarah's there, coming to you from New York. How are you doing, Susan? Hi, Chef. I'm great. I'm just great. We're having the September weather. That is the perfect, perfect weather, and it's like high 60s, it's dry, it's blue skies, so I'm feeling good. September has to be the best month uh, in the Northeast. Maybe you remember? I remember, and you know, we've been having some pretty good weather down here. The days are still kind of hot. And you, and you get kind of fooled because in the morning you can go out and you can sit out on the porch in the morning and it's nice and cool and when it's a little breezy it's just beautiful and then the nights are dropping down into the low 70s so it feels really, really pleasant out. We haven't hit the 60s yet. I don't expect to see them until probably January or February. So. Right, I, I know, but you know what, it's really funny because when, when uh, I find that as I as the seasons change, and now we're certainly transitioning into fall, it t seems to take me personally, I don't know if that's for most people, longer in terms of, say, you know, clothing, going from summer to fall clothing, going from summer to fall foods, and I'm not ready to make the chili yet, or to, or to make, you know, I, it, in fact, it's, it's almost like um, I'll do one fall dish and then I'll do some summer dishes and then as time goes on I'll do more for fall dishes and less less summer dishes you know what I mean it's kind of a transition yeah I know we men don't have to worry as much about clothing at least I don't in terms of changing your wardrobe over but I know what you mean um, oh yeah I mean forget it you know once you start wearing your fall clothing you know okay everyone's gonna see that for the next five months you know yeah. am I right ladies I mean I I know, absolutely. So what about this weekend? Did you eat anything terrific? Uh, yeah, we, we had a nice time. I went to a conference on Saturday. I went to Florida BlogCon, and uh, we had some fun there. And what did we eat? We, I think we went out to dinner Saturday, and I just had a, a little local place and uh, had a nice sandwich there. Uh, but what did we do yesterday? You know, it it's becomes all a blur for me sometimes. I know, me too. I, I, know I know somewhere in there we had lobster one night because I didn't want to cook, and that's my fail-safe for whenever I don't want to cook. Uh, I had made the salad dressing, and we've been enjoying our salads because of that. And uh, Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, well, I had, we had, uh, we took out sushi. So I had sushi one night. And, you know, I'll tell you something. My son, he saves the leftover sushi for the next day. I have never I didn't think it's a good idea to do, but so I don't do it and I don't eat it. But what do you think? Does he eat raw? Is it raw fish sushi? Yeah, I don't think it's the best idea. What do you think? Well, he's young, so it's not going to affect him as badly as it would us. <laughs> you know, young, younger people. You know, after they hit like twenty, they're they're pretty good until they hit about forty with stomach issues, and uh, you can you can eat things that you know you become almost like the family dog. You can eat things that everybody else can't. So you know, I don't want to put it in that respect. But. No, but I think you're right. Yeah. You're right because that's what my kids do. You know, I have two boys living with me, and then my my. Uh, future daughter-in-law and they're like grazing like you know whatever's left over they're always grazing so yeah their you know, immune systems aren't, aren't quite as, as um, easily uh, interrupted they I have should. stomachs of iron yeah. and I remember those days you know I was like oh, okay you smell it not and smell that bad all right let's eat it right oh exactly oh funny so what so we have now we have a fall would you I call this a fall dish. What do you think? Yeah, you know, it's a classic, and we were talking yeah. about it before we started. Steak Diane used to be a staple. There's a lot of dishes that were really so popular. I think when people really started going out to dinner in between the 40s, you know, after World War II, uh, into like the 80s, 70, in the late 70s and the 80s, a lot of people, you know, there were dinner clubs, uh, fancy restaurants, and there was a whole era of dining that I think was probably not as refined as it is now and you didn't have as many really talented chefs out but they came up with some really classic dishes and a lot of them have gone by the wayside you know I'm sorry to see them go uh, one of my favorite that you never see anymore is Clams Casino you know I just love those uh, but That's dishes, true. Like, yeah, dishes like that have kind of gone their way as people have uh, 
come into different types of fusion cooking and different styles and different techniques. So it's a lot of these classics. A steak Diane wasn't technically a classic. It was invented early in the 1900s. It's not a French dish. It's an American dish. Uh, we, I was telling you the, the history of it. It was named for Diana, the huntress, you know, the Roman goddess. Yeah. It was originally done in venison. You know, that went away really quick. Wow. So, uh, but, you know, it's still a nice dish. You don't have to and, call and it. You know what? I, I, I would love to bring, bring other dishes like this back throughout our broadcasts and do some that are forgotten, a little forgotten, but absolutely delicious. And, and you know, how about you? Would you like to do that? I think so. You know, and, and it's like going back into my repertoire. And, you know, there's yeah. things things will come to me for the oddest reason anymore. A, a word will just prompt something. You know, it's all stuck in that hard drive that's like overloaded with information that you can't find to save your life when you're looking for it. But all of a sudden, I'll sit there and it'll just, you know, <laughs> it'll just come out like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, I think we should do a little bit of retro, retro, uh, retro yeah. cooking. Absolutely. So I'm, I really, mm -hmm. you know, love this. All right. So, so uh, where do we go? Let's get started then. Uh, we're gonna start with our fillet. Now, I have, and you don't have to use fillet. I happen to like. Well, I don't eat beef, so I don't like fillet, but. Um, I like using it and I like working with it. My wife loves it because it's so tender. But that being said, you could easily use a uh, flat iron steak. You could use uh, uh, a London broil type of steak and, and sear it, cook it, and then make the sauce separately and serve it that way. So you know, any kind of a beef steak is really, you know, really good for this. And it's, it's more the experience in the sauce. So I've got a nice size... A fillet steak here, and I'm going to split it in half. So there's no, you know, I don't want people when I said cut it in half to think I meant cutting it, you know, indirectly in half. But I'm more or less going to be butterflying it, but all the way through. So I'm coming up with two thinner steaks. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, it's got a and nice. And it looks color. tender. Oh yeah, it feels good. You know, you yeah. can. Yeah. And I did leave some of the fat. I I took. The membrane off of it that would have been hard to eat, but you know, fat brings flavor, and some of it's going to cook off, and what doesn't, you know, she'll just pick off. So that's all you need to do to prepare. In the old days, we used to do it a couple of different ways, and one of the ways was to take mustard and coat the steak with the mustard, uh, and then dip it in flour and then saute it. So you know, you could do it that way. I haven't done it that way in a while, and I kind of like searing the steak without it. So at this point, I'm just going to turn on my cooker. Let it get a little hot. We'll throw some butter in it and uh, get started. Now, again, if you don't want to use butter, um, I'm using butter because classically when it was made, that's how it was made. But if you want to use extra virgin olive oil, that's fine. Ex except, you know, we're, we are making a pan sauce and because of that, that's one of the reasons we're using butter because the butter is going to give it some flavor as well. Okay, um, I have a question for you and this may seem, you know, some of my questions are let's say a little wacky and this one might be it. Um, I know I've in restaurants too in more old school type restaurants I, I, and I forget the name of it but essentially it's sirloin chop, chopped meat that's it, it's not in the shape of a burger maybe it's a little bigger and rounder mm -hmm. but could you do this with a good Chopped meat and have this sauce. Oh sure, accompany like a, it. Like a Salisbury steak, almost kind of a thing. Yeah, but Salisbury steak is a steak, isn't it? No, it's chopped meat. Okay, then that must be what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's a chopped and formed patty. No. Um, yeah, then that must be what I'm talking about. That would work fine. You know, anything you want to use, it doesn't have to be an expensive cut of meat because, again, it's all about the sauce. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, I love the comment Aslan just put up. Here we go. Let's throw that up. Little ditty about Jack and Diane, two American kids grown up in the heartland. <laughs> Jackie going to be a football star and Diane got fried. Oh, that's good. Now, Diane's going to get fried right now. <laughs> but actually, my version of it is called Danielle. So I'm going to throw a little butter in here. Let that get melted. Okay, and Chef, can I, I have I have lots of questions on this dish. Sure. I also want to know what about what about the pan? Um, can you use nonstick? Can you sure. use, should you use what about cast iron? You what can about, use 
You can use any pan you like. It, the pan has no matter in it. Oh, it I, doesn't. One type isn't. Yeah. I mean, do you want a crust? Uh, not necessarily. No. Yeah, I mean, you can have a little crust on it, but we're not really taking it to the level to put a crust to worry about there being a crust on it. That's not going to be the objective here. Okay, so you can do nonstick then. Yes. And, you know, I should have salted it and peppered it before it went in. I did forget that because I cut it in front of you. What I sh you know, would have done normally is cut it, seasoned it, and let it sit for a little bit. So we'll watch the seasoning. And, again, another thing about this is the meat was room temperature. It sat out for a while, so it's going to cook more evenly. Oh, good point. Because good when the meat's too cold, what happens is it'll cook faster on the outside and it'll leave the inside a little more rare. So if you like that, that's good. If you want it to be more evenly done, then you want to do it the other way. So, you know, this is pretty thin. It's going to cook pretty quick. Lisa likes hers well done, so it's going to cook a little bit longer than normal. But you can see it's starting to, it's got a nice color. So you don't want to, yeah. you, don't, you don't want to muddy up that nice piece of meat. Like this is really pretty where there's a little bit of a crusting around the edge and it's starting to look nice. So that's that's good. All right, so as this is cooking and we just let it cook briefly, I'm going to add in some garlic and some shallots. And if you don't like uh, garlic or shallots or just want to use a little onion, again, that's fine. Or if you just want to use garlic, that's fine. This is, again, a, a classical in interpretation of it. And that's about all I'm going to do with them there. And then I'm going to throw some mushrooms in. See, now the one thing about using butter is it's not as forgiving. And you have to be a little faster with it because butter's heating, uh, cooking temperature is a little bit, burn temperature is a little bit lower than anything else you're going to use. Yeah, and once you put garlic in there, you better uh, watch that garlic. Right. right? So that's why, you know, it goes in, it gets a little tossed. The shallots are going to hold up a little bit better. Now tell me something about the mushrooms. Um, would you use different types of mushrooms? And can you really tell the difference in the taste? I never know if I really tell a difference in the taste. Between portobellos, the small portobellos, I don't, I don't tell any difference. It's just a matter of the look. Uh, I'm, I, I opted for the white mushrooms for this just because I wanted the contrast. I wanted okay, what about like shiitake and those uh, chanterelle and the other types of mushrooms? Well, they're a lot woodier. Oh, that's beautiful. They're a lot, I'm going to pull this out because I don't want it to get too well done. Okay. This is perfect. Um, they're woodier and they're going to have a little bit of a different flavor. So, you know, they can be good in an instance like this or they can be good in other dishes and they're interchangeable. You just got to make sure that you really know that flavor and you enjoy that flavor. Okay? So this is pretty much all we have to do. We've got our mushrooms in. They're cooked well enough. We've got our shallots in. I'm going to take this off. I've got my beef off. And now I'm just going to add a little bit of bourbon. And if you want to affect, if you can get it. Of course. I mean, let's take us back to the 1960s. When they used to flambe. <laughs> okay. It's not necessarily necessary. And I wouldn't do it with anything that isn't long enough, you know, unless you want to singe all the hair off your hands. But that's pretty much it. And then it says to call for some beef stock. I've actually got some chicken stock here. You can use either or. Chicken stock is just going to make the sauce a little bit lighter. The beef would so make it a little richer. So, Chef, there's not really a difference in the uh, taste between burnt, between the flame, flaming, flaming it and not flaming it? You just want to burn the alcohol off. So it would cook enough just to get the alcohol off. But and why do you want to get the alcohol? Silly question. Why do you want to get the alcohol off? It, it does affect the flavor a little bit. Okay. So you don't want to have the harshness of the alcohol. Okay. Got some Worcestershire sauce here. All right, so we have the stock in there that's burned off. I'm going to add some mustard. And again, it's a brown mustard. And I need one more thing. I did not get my cream out. Nice blend of flavors there. And now we hit it with a little bit of, 
Oops. Pops on. I haven't used it yet. Okay. Now, what about any low-fat substitutes for uh, the cream? Sure. Non-fat Greek yogurt, half and half, light cream. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, if, if this isn't going to be something you're going to eat all the time. Yeah. So that's going to reduce, and once it's reduced, we're going to serve it up. So, so that's that. very that's very light. That's a very light color. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's going to cook down a little bit. The beef stock, if I had had beef stock, mm -hmm. it would have been a little bit darker. So that would have been a difference. Now I'm going to throw a little bit of butter and flour in there. Oh, there you go. There you go. I, you, if you missed it, he took it with his fingers. I certainly did. <laughs> that's my vermeer, and that's how I tighten up any pan sauces or any saute dishes. So this is pretty much, I'm going to turn it down a little more. Oh, yeah. Okay. Nice flavor. Finger I'm looking ready. good. Just let it reduce just a little bit more. I want to see you stir it with your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you said that. <laughs> there you go. I'm a little that out was of practice. fast. Well, I'm a little out of practice, and it was a little hot. <laughs> wow. Induction cookers get really hot fast. They do. And the whole trick with stirring with your fingers is you didn't do it at the end. You did it when you added all the ingredients. Oh, in. okay. <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't that hot yet. Okay. No, but you know, but you can handle it. I so I mean, I think this this dish goes so well with entertaining, and I have some thoughts about entertaining in the kitchen. Should uh should we transition now, or should we wait a little oh, bit? Fine. Let's talk. This is reducing. Okay. So, you know, I'll tell you, I've designed kitchens for people who, uh, they, they really are passionate cooks, and they want their kitchen designed so that they can sort of be center stage and, and you know, and talk to their guests and, uh, you know, have that whole big social thing going on. And, you know, Chef, I see that, of course, you have an island, and I'm, I'm wondering, I'd like to ask you, you know, you have guests over, and and do you find the island as a social gathering place, and are you cooking uh, in front of your guests, and do you enjoy that? I, I usually don't cook in front of them, unless it's something like a show that we're doing. Uh, you know, being the kind of uh, anal retentive person that a chef that I am, I want everything to be done before they really get here or get situated, so... I won't be actually finishing some cooking. I do use the stove for cooking, and I'll leave things like if I'm making soups or anything hot. If I have a cro the big my big crock pot out, the huge one, I'll put stuff in there, or I'll leave stuff on the stove on a very low temperature, just you know, warming, uh, and let them come around and eat. But you know, I tell you, I will never want to be in a kitchen without an island again. It's just, wow. it has made such a big difference. I mean, we had one where we lived before, but it was so small, it was almost, wasn't worth having. You know, Interesting. This, this one is, is really a good size. I could see it just a little bit bigger. There's enough room for it here. But, I mean, it's just has made my life so much more enjoyable when people are over, especially, because now they can sit on the other side you know, they can just mill around here. There's a place to put food down if they're eating. They don't have to be as precarious walking around. And, and not everyone has to jam themselves around the dinner table. You're right. It's all about flexibility. And I have a few uh, pictures to show just of and kitchens that are designed for entertaining and different little ideas here and there. So I'm going to bring those up real quick. And here, yep. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so here's one. Now, this is a pretty fancy kitchen, and this is if you want your kitchen sort of integrated into surrounding rooms, and you want your kitchen to also speak the language of, you know, a little formality and sort of an, a, a room rather than a utilitarian space, you know, you might have something like this, you know, pretty gigantic chandelier, but still, we have the sink there, we have the cutting board. And imagine this being a social um, place, which I think, you know, we could do very well. Here's a big island. Now, again, this it has the look of something formal, yet it's utilitarian. You have the sink and the cooktop right there. So how much, you know, it just 
it gives a whole other feeling to being in the kitchen. Uh, here's some areas that these doors can conceal uh, the open sort of closet areas, but and you know you have lighting there. It it looks um, special. It doesn't look so utilitarian, even though it is. Here's a you know kind of cool sort of table concept that has a uh, a cooktop on it, and then we have specialty areas. Here's the wine area. And over there is another little prep area. So, and it is wide open. It is utilitarian, but it's also a furniture kind of a look. Here's an island. I mean, doesn't everyone have a Grecian bust on their island? I mean, <laughs> you know, really. And it also has a lower section for dining, for putting uh, 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 buffet items, whatever. And Here's a little bit of a glam table. This could be a prep table. It could be a dining table. And how about some herbs? How about a way to separate the kitchen from the surrounding rooms? And then you have some herbs all across. So that's sort of a cool way to do it. And here's an expansive. Don't we all have room for an island this size in our homes? I wish. <laughs> I know, right? So this is just going every which way, and it can accommodate so many different, um, so many different lifestyles. And here, there are two big sort of armoires, and you open the doors, and then they are, uh, you know, they're they're countertops and prep areas, individual prep areas. So a lot, kitchens don't look are not always looking like kitchens anymore. They're integrating with surrounding rooms. And here's a little cart that's next to an island. Really cool. And uh, we're just, you know, sort of the kitchen is evolving into a more sort of environment. And that's what I have to show you. Great. Yeah. yeah. Kitchens have changed from being a place where you just gathered around and cooked to being more of an interactive section of the house. I mean, you see computers going into kitchens, tables going into kitchen desks. Uh, they're becoming more active spaces, and which is a good thing because anytime you can get people back into the kitchen, however you do it, it's a good thing. You just got to remember to cook in it, too. That's right. That's right. So. So this is pretty much, I mean, it's it's thickened up nicely here. It's darkened up just a little bit. So this is something, too, that you could do ahead of time if you wanted to for a party. So let's say you wanted to serve uh, Steak Diane or something similar. And it could be, you could have roasted a whole filet, too, and just made the sauce and served it over it as you sliced it down. That would be nice. Or, again, a, a flat iron steak, a flank steak, or any anything resembling that. You know, I do want to ask you because I meant to ask you, how do you tell, how do you like to tell when the uh, meat is done to your liking? Do you and Lisa both like it well done? Oh, no. I, well, I don't eat beef, but when I did, it had to be rare. Um, and she eats it well done. So, no, it, it's, it's a little harder. But the way to tell is if you use your hand, okay, and you push right here. Oh. Okay, wow. that should be medium rare. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that that's medium rare. Okay. All right, so we've got it plated. Now, if Ooh. I had taken it off, any juice that was left, there really wasn't much here, would have gone back into this. And then let me get a decent sized spoon. To do this, right? All right, so you've got your steak there, and if it now one thing about fillet is it does not have to be piping hot. Okay, it can be it can be warm to hot. Now this could go back in the pan. I hate to muddy it up mm -hmm. with the sauce because it's so pretty. Okay, so I like to get them to a temperature. If you wanted to cook this a little more, you might even think about just popping it in the oven for a few minutes to warm it up to get a little more temper. And when you take them off put them on a cookie treat sheet in a low oven. But at this point, you know, it's done. So then we're just going to take our sauce. Remember, the filet is the star. Uh-huh. So you want it to remain the star. So the sauce is not going to cover. Okay. 
cover everything. So that would be pretty much it. And then in the initial recipe, these get cooked into it. But I don't like to cook them because they just turn to mush and they get ugly, the green onions. So I use them more as a garnish at this point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A little bit of parsley. You want to hit it with a little bit more salt pepper. Boom. That looks great. It's okay to have a little bit of green around the edge of the plate. You just don't really want the pepper or salt there. Okay, that looks terrific. But even if you um, were you wanted to decorate a plate a little, take a little parsley. Can you turn that 90 degrees? Not 180, but 90. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. Nice. That's a, oh, I love the parsley on the plate. Yeah, so just take your parsley in your fingers and just boom. We used to make a confetti, and we would take carrots, take beets, and take um, parsley. The only trick with it that you have to do is you have to squeeze all the liquid out of the carrots and the beets or it turns into a mush. So you just want to put them in a napkin, squeeze it out, and then mix all three together and you have a very colorful confetti. But if you don't have time, and this actually isn't parsley because I didn't have any, and it's a little spinach. Okay. Now that looks just wonderful. Now I, I do have one question. Um, what do you think about, would it be too many flavors to add, say, something like fresh thyme, fresh tarragon, and th or thyme, or rosemary? Would that enhance it at all, Is it, or it's just well, unnecessary? I think with the flavor of the bourbon and the flavor of the shallots, uh, I think it might be a little too much for the dish. And, and probably with the Worcestershire. Yeah. I, I think it might just be taking it over a little to a different realm. And one of the things that people do get involved with a lot of times with fusion is they start blending in too many flavors. So you want them to stay intact to the point where you can identify them but not really being so overpowering that they're going to, just like the sauce shouldn't be too mustardy, it shouldn't be too Worcestershire sauce, it should be a blend. Okay, so, it, so it's a classic for a reason. Yeah, you know, and it, again, it's flavors. It's, it's simple, it's simplicity. I mean, you saw how fast it was to make. Yeah. And again, if you were doing a flat iron steak or a flank steak and you wanted to grill it, you wanted to roast it in the oven, and then just make your sauce on the stovetop with mushrooms, you can do that and just serve it that way. I mean, it does not have to go into the pan to be fried with butter, you know, so you could avoid that step if you wanted to. But it's all about presentation. It's all about, you know, if you if you got a flank steak, and I should do one to show you, is you want to make sure you're slicing it down in nice slices and put it all back together so it's presented nicely. One thing about beef, okay, if you're going to cut beef, or even chicken for that matter, any meat that you roast, you need to let it rest before you cut it. And, and I don't mean, you know, tuck it into bed and with a night, you know, with a blanket and all that. I mean, set it down, don't touch it, don't cut it. Give it a good 10 minutes. You know, the thicker the meat, the longer you need to let it rest. But okay, but I, have a, but I have a question. Do you take it out maybe a little bit before you think it's done and then it'll continue cooking? Yes, yes. Meat, oh, okay. meat raises 10 degrees after it comes out of the oven. Okay, it continues to cook, and the, again, the bigger the piece of meat, the longer it's going to keep cooking that you leave it intact. So when you pull a piece of meat out, if it's if you want 145, if you're looking at beef, it should come out around 135, 140 in that range. If you pull it out 145, you're liable to get 150, 155. So it might not be that medium rare that you wanted or it might not be, you know, red enough for you. And usually red's the only problem we have. You can always cook it longer to make it more done. It's hard to take it away once it's once it's out. But even with poultry or pork, you know, it's the same thing. It's it's going to raise about another 10 degrees as it continues to cook. Yeah. I mean, I feel with poultry that you almost have a, a very small window, an yes. extremely small window where it's uh, it's not uh, raw and it's not overdone, right? And, and the problem with poultry is is that 
the dark meat tends to cook a little differently than the white meat. Yeah. So, you know, by the time you got your dark meat cooked, the white meat's dried out. So, you know, those are the problems that you run into. I mean, I, sometimes I think we should just roast chickens upside down for the most part um, so that the top gets more heat. Or, or, you know, open them up. You know, I think sometimes we're married to the fact that we want to put that whole bird in there. You know, maybe we need to split it down the middle and just put the halves in instead, you know, so it's mm. easier to control how we cook. Or, or you don't even have to go all the way, just butterfly it and open it up uh, yeah. you know, a little easier. Well, this is a beautiful, beautiful dish, easy, elegant, yes. and uh, I, I think it's a perfect dish to uh, do if you're socializing, if you're entertaining in the kitchen, because it really, the steps are very easy, yes. and, and if you're that type of person that you like to cook as a little bit of performance art, yeah, and honestly, this is a good one. If you're doing a party, one piece would be enough if you're serving different foods. Don't think that you have to, you know, give each person like six or eight ounces of meat. You know, three or four ounces is plenty if you're doing some kind of a service because you're going to give them, like I would make garlic mashed potatoes to go with this, and I've got some green beans back here I'm going to cook for tonight very simply. So, you know, you, there's so much more that they're going to eat in comparison to this. And, and if you give them less than you think they want, they're going to savor it. If you give them too much, the last few bites are going to be forced and full. Oh, I love it. So yep. leave them wanting. Leave them wanting. Well, we'll leave our viewers wanting, Chef. And uh, thanks so much for this one. This was really great. I mean, the classics are for a reason. Absolutely. You know, and it's it's good. They're forgotten. So let's bring them back, and your guests will go, wow. Yeah. Yep. Let's do that in future shows. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan to me. All right, Susan, thanks so much for coming. And everyone who joined us, uh, Jamal, Aslan, Elena, I see you, Nazim is in the house, uh, Sandra Watson, and yeah, Elena, uh, yeah. Maggie Unzueta is here. Uh, we've got such a nice crowd. Christopher Vogelman's in the house. So thank you all for stopping by. Sorry if I missed anyone, but we'll see you again next week around your kitchen table. So have a great week. Bye-bye.